Hi everyone, it's time. My name is Nicole Alvarez, but you know, we are friends now. Welcome to the K-Rock DTS Sound Space. May I introduce Mr. Billy Corgan. That's Elbow. That's Elbow, cool. Hi, Billy. Hello. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. I'm sitting here and I, it's, it's weird because I know I don't know you, but it feels like I do because you have been a part of my life, my entire life, and I typically don't speak for others, but I think I can speak for the whole room when I say that your body of work, your entire body of work is sewn into the fabric of our lives. And that's, it's true. And that's a powerful position to be in. Do you ever stop and think that there are millions of people that carry your songs around as if they were their own? and they, they unlock our memories, they act as friends to us. Is that something that is terrifying or humbling? Um, in the way that you ask it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because, <laughs> um, you know, everything from tattoos to people getting married to people having kids to mourning a lost loved one, and when they include your music, it's a really tremendous honor. I think the, the difficulty for the band has been that um, even despite all the success that we've had, we've always had other people try to define who we are and who we aren't. And I think until that journey is kind of done, we're still kind of in the fight okay. of, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, like this is the Smashing Pumpkins because for everything that we've done, there's been twice as much energy around what we didn't do or what we should have done. Um, and I think over time, especially with the new record, we've sort of proven that our way is the best way for us. We understand why it's not the best way for everybody who wanted Siamese Dream 2 or whatever. But for us, that's why we're still going because we trust each other and that musical language and that journey has always kind of kept us going. Um, and even when we played the Hollywood Bowl the other night, I mean, we played a bunch of new songs and that's really important to us. Um, to not, uh, you know, and I think it's very much a message of 2022 and to not let other people define what your life is, who you are as a person, whether it's your sexuality or your gender or who you love. Don't let other people tell you who you are. You be you. And ever since I was a little kid, I've heard, I'm doing it wrong. You're too weird. You know what I mean? It's like, it's always been part of my life. Yeah. I don't remember a time w when everybody was just like, hey, you're cool the way you are. It was always something was wrong with me. And that extended into the music uh, world. And so I think if you gave us truth serum, we're really, really, really humbled, um, particularly here in Southern California, by the love that the fans here have always shown us, always, from the very beginning, from the earliest days of the band. It touches us. Um, you know, that gig the other night that we played, I mean, it really meant a lot to us. I um, want to talk about that gig. So the Smashing Pumpkins, it was the last show of the tour. The Smashing Pumpkins played a stunning show at the Hollywood Bowl, 17 magical songs, including We Only Come Out at Night, which was a surprise I've been running after that song my entire life. Um, and the, the night was perfect. Like, the weather was perfect. The set list was perfect. And one of the happiest surprises was seeing how multi-generational the crowd was. Mm -hmm. Do you have any expectations as far as what you're going to see when you look out when you go on stage these days? Or do you just, fuck it, I'm just going to go and see what happens? Well, it really depends on where we are. Because certain parts of America, it's very much like, oh, it's the 90s. Yeah. And, 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 it's very and much I, not. And I get, no, but I'm saying I get that. Because um, for some people, that culture, let's call it Gen X culture, it never had like a second act even though, obviously, here in Southern California, in New York, and Chicago, whether it's Blink-182 or Green Day, bands of our generation have had second and third acts. For many people in the country, they still see us as an anachronistic sort of postcard from another time. And so sometimes we walk on the stage and you're like, oh, this is that crowd. Yeah. And you can feel it beforehand? Oh, you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah, because you'll play something like... Um, like the fourth song in our set, I believe, is Sear, which is from our last record, um, the Sear album. And I, I go off mic and I do my little disco moves and I, <laughs> I, I literally look at 40 somethings like, with this, what, what is, is happening? happening to Billy? What is happening? <laughs> what is happening to Billy right now? <laughs> like I'm comfortable in the goth thing and the guitar and the weirdness, but like 
you dancing and singing to a disco song is just too weird for me. But how cool is it to push people like that outside of their comfort zone? Do you get any gratification out of that? Because I think it's fun. I think if you're in music and you're not pushing boundaries, I mean, why are you in music? Exactly. It's called the arts for a reason, you know? Um, I once had a very powerful person in the music business, right, actually right down the road at the Chateau Marmont, circa 98, say, in an English accent, you know, Billy, it's the music business for a reason. <laughs> you know, don't forget it, you know? Don't forget it. And um, that's cool, too, you know? Um, it's what makes the world go round. But for us, it, there was never a map. I mean, we started as a psychedelic jam band, and we morphed into a pop grunge band, into a dark entity, into a goth electro band, <laughs> into an even darker goth band. And every time we would do it, people would be like, what's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> and we were just like, it's fun. It's like, it's, it's a form of dress up, right? Yeah. Musical identity is as, form of, is, is as fun as dressing up. That's why I don't dress up for Halloween because I'm in Halloween the other 364 <laughs> the days out of the year. <laughs> you are at a point in your career where your body of work is so good and successful, it's gold. You could easily ride that wave and just tour every once in a while. You could also ride the wave of nostalgia for the, for the people out there that don't want to let the 90s go. But you have chosen instead, which is very, uh, from what I know, very much like you is to ambitiously step into your next chapter, which brings me to Autumn. When you wrote Melancholy, did you see the arc already that would end at Autumn? Was the was it all planned out? No. No? No. I had such a negative reaction to, and I'm gonna say this very loosely, fame. Okay. It was so weird to me, right? Because I saw where fame for other people was this really cool thing. And I don't need to name the names, but you know the names of our generation where it was like, I like you being weird and the way you are. That's a good thing. With us, it was like, yeah, you're famous, but you're still weird, and it's not a good thing. <laughs> so it was the double whammy of like, you know, you go to the Italian restaurant, and grandma wanted to come out of the kitchen and talk to you at 75 years old, and you're like, well, this is wild. <laughs> but then there were all these other people who were like, well, you're not this, and you're not, you know, again, same, yeah. same quote, right? So... Melancholy was my way of saying, I'm going to hide behind this personality of zero. And uh, when I shaved my head and, and I started wearing the zero shirt, which I guess I'm still wearing. Yes. Um, Correct. It, it worked in this weird, magical way. It allowed me to be somebody that I was, but wasn't courageous enough to be on stage. And conversely, the audience seemed to gravitate towards that cartoon character. And so I was like, oh, wow, this is actually working. This is kind of cool. And so I really leaned into it. And the songs on Melancholy were an extension of that sort of like, I can be whoever I want to be today. I don't have to be who I was yesterday or who you want me to be tomorrow. And that you can see, particularly around that period, I think the band released 57 songs in two years. Yes. I mean, we just had this massive explosion of creativity. It was glorious. It was like Christmas every day. Yeah, it was really fun. And um, so when we got around to Machina and I announced um, quite infamously on K-Rock with Tammy, <laughs> May 23rd, 2000, that the band was breaking wow. up. Um, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm a little sick, so I thought it was funny, right? Like, like I announced the band was breaking up on K-Rock, I might as well die on K-Rock too, <laughs> which is why I'm here. I'm actually gonna die Talk today. about a full circle moment. No, we don't want that, we don't want that. But, um, when we got around to Machina and the band had decided internally to break up, but then the album became about, well, is there a way we can do this in a creative way? And hence the costumes and the weirdness. And the band, of course, agreed to all this as a concept and then quickly abandoned it. So I was the only one living this weird. Yeah. And if, if anybody um, cares to know, the whole concept that we had agreed to was the band had become such a caricature of herself that we were actually going to play the caricatures of ourselves. Oh, wow. <laughs> So we were, if, if everybody thought we were bloated, insane rock stars, we were going to be bloated, gonna... insane rock stars. Yeah. And everybody agreed to it. And then once we started doing interviews, the band was like, I'm yeah. not doing that. But oh, I was still doing it. <laughs> so I looked really insane. <laughs> and they looked kind of actually more normal. In, in, <laughs> and so, so yeah. So with the, when the band broke up in 2000, um, at the end of the year, um, you know, I never thought there would be a third act. But as soon as James came back to the band, I started thinking about this crazy idea I had about an artist in exile, and 
Um, I pitched it to the band at the beginning of James coming back, and everybody just kind of went, mm, sounds like a lot of work. Did you know that it would bookend those two albums, or was it ever was was there ever a point that it could have been just like its own conceptual thing? No, it's it's chapter three of the. It's story. chapter three of the yeah, story. So we go from zero to glass on Machina, and this is shiny. This is the third chapter of this character that I started playing around ninety four, ninety five. How different is this character from zero? Now that you've you've grown, you've evolved, you've experienced things. Like, is has the character as well? Well, zero. Um, believed he could change the world. Um, by uh, Machina, uh, Glass realized he couldn't change the world, that it was gonna destroy him. And then Shiny, 20 years later, knows that he can't change the world. Um, and the story actually revolves around somebody accepting, I don't have as much power as I think I do. Um, yes, I've made beautiful things and it's beautiful, but I'm, I'm not that powerful. I just kinda wanna do what I'm gonna do. And, um, and I think there's something beautiful about that there because Look, when you're 20 and, and you're on MTV every 19 seconds and stuff, I mean, it's easy <laughs> to get whacked out and think that, you know, because you talk about, I don't know, cows or something, like everyone's going <laughs> to listen. And there's something beautiful about that, and it is more for youth. But I think as you get older, you start to have a deeper respect for people with different opinions, uh, different perspectives, and you also start to know that, uh, or realize, you should at that point realize that the, that the world is, is a much more complicated place as, as far as it involves power and dynamics and governments. And now, of course, we talk almost every day about censorship and Twitter and Elon. And you know, These are all subjects that are very much um, kind of in our face at a daily level. So I'm glad I figured out long ago that my voice is just one voice in a, in a much more uh, profound and big chorus. And I'm happy to be part of that chorus. It doesn't bother me. I'm OK with that. But I also don't walk around thinking that if I tweet something or say something, like an army's going to rise yeah. up and somehow that's fair. fix that's the world fair. via K-Rock. You know? That's fair. That's fair. I want you all to experience Autumn Act 1 for yourself, so I'm not going to inject my opinion other than it's really, really, really good. There's one moment on the record that surprised me, sonically surprised me, and that's the song Hooray, yeah. because I wasn't expecting a celestial disco dance party. Like towards the, It's a disco dance party, and you don't expect that from the Smashing Pumpkins. It's my favorite song on the album as of now. Oh, thank you. But what, it's just so much fun. It makes me feel good good and roll the windows down kind of song and I didn't expect that from you did that surprise you when you wrote it no because in the story um, and if anybody's been listening to my podcast I've been explaining the story each song but in that particular song these kids who are sort of in danger they find this robot in an old amusement park like think of Disneyland all run down and they're able to access this robot um, via this information that they have. So that's the robot's signature song. Okay, it's awesome. And I saw Electrical Main Street Parade in 1974 at Disneyland. And it I still have a very like profound memory of yeah. watching that go by. And so if you listen to that song, that's me doing my version of Electrical Main Street Parade. It completely sounds like that. Like if that parade had a soundtrack or one song that you want to play, it's... Sung by a robot, though. It's sung by a robot, though. Yeah, it's hooray. Um, I also want to talk about, there was an interview, and something you said intrigued me, I think it was Guitar World, where you talk about how Black Sabbath was your blueprint and you spent your whole life chasing that sound. Yep. But in chasing that sound, you very much found a Smashing Pumpkin sound, the Smashing Pumpkin sound. If you play a Smashing Pumpkin song just two seconds anywhere, people will automatically go, that's Smashing Pumpkins. Not Smashing Pumpkins trying to be nothing. So are you still chasing? Oh, yeah. Yeah? The Black Sabbath sound? Oh, yeah. What is it about that sound that you feel like you have not reached or accomplished or that's so intriguing to you? Well, I think we all have those memories when we're young, when a certain thing makes us feel a certain way. And the first time I ever listened to Black Sabbath, I was eight years old. My uncle was a drummer. Um, he passed away very young, but he had this cool stereo and a bunch of progressive rock records like Yes and Jethro Tull. And the first record in the pile was Black Sabbath Master of Reality. And I said to my grandmother at eight, hey, can I play something on a stereo? And she gave me that look like, I'm going to get in big trouble from your uncle. Yeah. And I talked her into it, basically just a little bit um, older than my son is right now. And um, the first song was Sweet Leaf. You know, you hear the Ozzy's cough or whatever, and then that sound comes in. And I was just like, it made me feel as if I was steering into the cosmos or something. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know how else to explain other than I've, I felt this kind of sense of agape, like, yeah, I know the wow, feeling. this is what God sounds like. Yep, you know I, I mean? know the feeling well. So it's the eight-year-old version of what God sounds like, but I've never found anything cooler. 
That's amazing. This I could talk to him for hours, but I, I'm going to eventually have to let him go. This has nothing to do with music. This is just like a personal curiosity and for satisfaction. Um, if you were to put a bunch of rock stars and artists in a lineup and be like, one of them likes wrestling, I would immediately take him out. I mean, it's not Billy Corgan. It's Weird Al Yankovic is the one. And yet you love it, and I'm a wrestling baby, so I just wanted to know when you got indoctrinated into that world, because I'm an Andre the Giant Junkyard Dog era girl. Yes. Yeah, you remember them? Of course. I mean, they, they yes. both work for the NWA, which is the company that I own um, since 1948. It's a, it's a great honor. But um, I used to watch wrestling with my great-grandmother, who was in her 80s, from Belgium, barely spoke English. Amazing. And my grandfather in his 60s, and so at five years old, I would watch these people scream at me through the television. And it obviously made an impression on me. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, I, I kind of look at the wrestling thing as like, um, it falls under the category of, um, there's n if you don't have any reason to not live your dreams, then you should live your dreams. And so oh. I don't know why one of my dreams is to work in professional wrestling, but <laughs> it, it's crazy, but... I think the thing I'm most proud of, besides the fact that I've sort of brought the NWA back from the dead, is that in wrestling, most people don't see me as Billy Corgan the musician. They yeah. just know me as Billy Corgan in wrestling. So I've had to earn my respect and operate in the world. And not everybody agrees with my perspective on wrestling, just like they don't agree with <laughs> my perspective in rock and roll. But that's okay. But that's why I always say it's like, I just tell people like, a lot of people pull you aside in an airport and say, like, what's the magic sauce of life? It's just like, yeah. you got to live your dream. Yeah, that's it. It's and, as simple and, as that. And some of the best people I've ever met are, like, amazing nurses or amazing firemen or, you know what I mean, people who are super committed to what they believe in. That's always humbling. Yeah. And so I don't want to be, especially, with, I have very young kids, seven and four. I don't want them to look at me as somebody who should have done something or didn't do something. I always want them to think, well, Dad did what he believed in, even if it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Insanity is fun. Yeah, well, I mean, it's worked out well for me, you know. So um, he's basically, he's saying, you do you, boo. And that's like, honestly, the best advice is like, you do you, who cares what everybody else is thinking or saying, just live your dreams. Just to interrupt. So we have yeah. a saying in our world, because I also have a tea house, um, sorrow is the family business. Sorrow is the family business. The Corgan family, family business. business is sorrow. <laughs> Before I let you go, um, I also want to say one more thing about Autumn and Smashing Pumpkins now. Your guitar work lately is on fucking fire. Like, just beguiled. And I think it's um, beyond the... Beyond the veil. Thank you. Okay, so beyond the veil. Like, it's just, it's just it, you sound better than ever. And oh, it's, thank you. It's incredible. Um, the last thing I will say, Sunday night I went to see Elton John's last show at Dodger Stadium. And I watched this beautiful man go through his body of work very sentimentally and whatnot, and then say goodbye. Do you think that you're at a legacy point yet where you think about what you want to leave behind? Or are you any close to satisfaction? All the time. OK, cool. Do you have a general idea about? Yes, I do. A, do you, are you going to share it with me? No. OK, cool. <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, I just want to say I hope that K-Rock at the end of the day has a special place in your heart and I think you're cool enough. You are an institution, Billy Corgan. Oh, thank an you. An institution. Thank you. I'm going to give you guys the man you came to see. Again, let's hear it for Billy Corgan.
colors go after the moon your way and she knows and she knows she knows she knows and she knows she knows she knows House, and she knows, she knows, she knows, and she knows, she knows. And the show after the moon. I should go see you in June. Your way, and she knows, and she knows. She knows, she knows, and she knows, she knows, she knows, hows, and she knows, she knows, she knows, and she knows, she knows. your eyes to these muscle lies Oh they rise to these muscle lies that way she knows and she knows she knows, she knows, and she knows, she knows, she knows, hows, and she knows, she knows, she knows, and she knows, she knows, she knows. Coming on. We have a very special guest. Where are you going to stand? You going to stand there? Okay. This is my daughter, Philomena Clementine. My son, Augustus, Augustus Jupiter. Are you dancing or what are you doing? Are you going to dance to the song? All right. You're going to sing. Okay, here we go. 
hear the guitar okay? Guitar's okay? Okay, cool. It's a little song from Melancholy called We Only Come Out at Night. We only come out at night We only come out at night The days are much too bright We only come out at night and Once again You pretend to know Once again, I'll pretend to know the way through the empty space, through the secret places of the heart. We only come out at night. We only come out at night The days are much too bright We only come out at night I Walk alone I Walk alone to find my way I'm out on my own I'm out on my own To see the way That I can't help the days You will make it home I don't care No, you can We only come out we only come out at night The days are much too bright We only come out at night but Once again now You pretend to know that There's an end but there's an end to this begin It will help you sleep at night It will make it so that rise always bright We only come out at night We only come out at night the days are much too bright We only come out at night We only come out at night We only come out at night The days are much too bright We only come out at night Thank you. Fragments on the mind Shadows hold a man's fraction And this way Shadows are a sign 
One of the great things about being in a band is all these great mythological things pop up. Jimmy Chamberlain, the great drummer of the Smashing Pumpkins, likes to tell a story that I wrote this song in one day and we recorded it that night, which is totally not true. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. It was more like months. But it turned out all right. You want to get in trouble or what? what is it? You want to come back on stage? All right. Are we going to get some fancy dancing? Okay, go over there. Go over there. You going to go there? This is what we call in the pumpkin smoke and mirrors. If you focus on the kids, you won't hear the. <laughs> Ready? <coughs> what song you want to hear? <laughs> Are you here with us? <laughs> you going to answer? It's good to see the genetics pass through. <laughs>
this never time at all You can never ever leave Without leaving a piece of you And our lives will forever change We will never be the same The more you change, the less you feel The life can change, you're not stuck in me. We're not the same, we're different ways tonight. Tonight, tonight, so bright, tonight. And you know you never should But you sure you could be right If you held yourself up till that night And the end was never faint In your city by the lake The place where I was born Stay up now And if you believe Start a chance tonight Tonight So bright So bright Tonight Tonight We'll crucify the incense here tonight We'll make things right, we'll fail it all tonight We'll find a way to offer up the night The indescribable moments of your life The impossible is possible Tonight, believe in me as I believe in you. Tonight, 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 tonight. Thank you all for being here, honestly, thank you. Well, I'd like to play a song acoustic that I've never played before, acoustic. So you're the test, test audience. <laughs> Now, you haven't busted out any fancy moves yet. I want to see some fancy moves. Are we going to see some fancy moves? This is my last song. Come on. You got you to gotta bust out here. This is usually where bribery works. <laughs> what would it take?
to get some fancy moves. Hot Wheels? All right, we're going to try this one. This is called Beguiled. To swallow how the serpent of many tags and faces get in us, crawl around the slum and tell the lies. You crack your boots, young pagans, cause like you, I was attached to drapes on cold, the seventeenth long drawn away from home. These lessons I was taught, taught, so taught. And now I'm telling you, retell the fame, retell the fame. The smashing out the veils, retell the fame. And there's no escape Sorry down the face The charging life brought games are down the face You gotta boom Come on, this is your spot So as betrayed by rainbow, here I convey I'm sold out, y'all dear cause, and the king has placed us in his jaws. It's true, no place can hold us. So in the state I'm December, y'all June's wretch, and my tears lay gasping as if death. And now I'm telling you Reach on the fame Reach on the fame Smashing out the veils It's on the fame And there's no escape so we on the fame The charging life rug games are town the fame You gotta move Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, this is the best dancer I've ever seen. Can we have a hand for her?
Guys, thank you so much. What Billy doesn't know is that I was so nervous on the way here, I thought I was going to vomit, but luckily I didn't throw up on him. Thank you. All we can hope is that you had a good time and that K-Rock has a special place in your heart. I'm Nicole Alvarez. Thank you. Get home safe. Thank you, Billy.